and to view Ramadan as a barometer for where you are, for where we are. Um, and I say that individually. So to, it, it affords us an opportunity to individually assess where we are with regards to our own relationship with God, with his faith, um, and with ourselves, how, how in tune we are with our own spiritual uh, development and progression. And so Ramadan affords us that barometer, that opportunity that comes periodically, once a year in this case, where we can really assess where, where we are. And the hope is that, that, that where you find yourself this Ramadan, whether it's your first or your 10th or your 30th or whatever, um, you know, you hope that you are in a better place spiritually and along the sort of spiritual uh, continuum where you, that you are in a better place than you were the previous Ramadan. And so Ramadan affords us that opportunity to kind of gauge ourselves, where we are. And then, because of the many opportunities, the, the various and sundry opportunities that we have in the month of Ramadan to connect with God, to connect with His faith, then we can recalibrate. We can gauge and then recalibrate. We can adjust. We can say, well, you know, I've been sort of been sort of lacking, you know, when it comes to prayer on time. Or I've been derelict or negligent in terms of how often I engage the book of God, how often I engage scripture. So let me use this opportunity in Ramadan to increase my recitation and reading of the Quran of Scripture. Uh, perhaps, um, I, you know, in previous years, I've sort of just gone through the fast on autopilot. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I get hungry, I get thirsty, but besides that, you know, I haven't really, you know, been anything really special about Ramadan. I haven't been coming to the mosque or going to the various places that have allowed me to come at night and pray or to do the, uh, to do the spiritual itikaf or the spiritual retreat in the last 10 days where I can spend day and night at the mosque in ibadah, in worship of God, um, you know, maybe this year will be the year that I can, I can do that. Um, you know, and, and various other things. It allows us an opportunity to assess and then recalibrate to avail ourselves of the many blessings that we find in the month of Ramadan. Uh, furthermore, and finally, by just way of introduction to the month of Ramadan, is that in addition to being a barometer, a gauge, and a way, an opportunity for us to recalibrate, Ramadan is also a, a should be, and, and can represent a paradigm shift. It can represent a catalyst, so that if we do find ourselves in a, in a, in a, less, than, in a less than pleasant or a less than ideal state with regards to our relationship with God, our relationship with His book, His scripture, his religion, um, and so on, that we can utilize, the, again, many opportunities that we have in the month of Ramadan and the many blessings that descend from the heavens quite literally in the month of Ramadan to allow that month of 29 or 30 days to be a paradigm shift in where we are with regards to our spiritual, our, our spiritual growth and progression. Um, allow Ramadan to be that catalyst that speeds up the process, that gives us a boost that we need in the month of Ramadan. I think that, uh, having said all of that, I think one of the important things that we should know, and I think this is especially poignant for those of us who are relatively new into the faith, is, and, and, and I say that not disparagingly, for sure, but because I, I say the same advice to people who have been lifelong Muslims, people who were born into the faith, is that if Ramadan is that intense crucible of 29 to 30 days where you give it your all, you know, in sort of uh, uh, sports, by way of a sports analogy or athletic analogy, I liken or I compare the month of Ramadan to a sprint. Right? If you're a runner, you know what a sprint is. A sprint is where you give it your all. You give it your all, full power, full speed, you know, legs burn out, but usually you're, you're doing that at full speed for a shorter duration of time or for a shorter length of time. It's, it's you burn out, right? It's, that's, that's what Ramadan is. Ramadan is that opportunity to sort of give it your all. But life in this faith is not a sprint. 
life in general, but certainly life as way as it, especially as it relates to our spiritual relationship with God, our spiritual progression and growth, is not a sprint. Life is a marathon. Life is a gradual, long-term phenomenon. You're in it for the long haul. And so the important thing to keep in mind is to pace yourself, right? If you're a marathon runner, you learn the importance of pace and of pacing yourself. Whereas if you're a sprint runner or a sprinter, um, you have a completely different uh, methodology as it comes to uh, your approach to the run. So we are marathon runners, we're not sprint runners. And as much as there is that impetus, or there is that, uh, that tendency to view Ramadan as a sprint where we just kind of give it all, and there's, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, that's a great training uh, mode. Um, in fact, think of it as like a boot, as, as a boot camp, right? 29, 30 days of a boot camp. But boot camp is there to allow you to get into the shape that you want so that you can sustain that, right? It's not just meant for the purposes of the boot camp itself, right? You're not just in it for those 29 days. You're not just in it for those 30 days. Because even, or, or if you are successful in that boot camp and you see results, you see gains, if you don't continue that at, in some capacity, you're going to lose all those gains. You're going to lose all that momentum that you had during the boot camp, right? And so even if Ramadan is that sprint, we can take the lessons that we learn in the month of Ramadan beyond the month of Ramadan, in the, in the other months, continue. And this is why, for example, one of the great uh, practices of the Prophet وسلم, peace be upon him, in the month that precedes uh, uh, Ramadan, in the month of Shawwal, is to fast six days. Now, depending on what school of law, and, and if you've been introduced, there's various schools of uh, religious law within Sunni Islam, um, and including the, Sh the Shi'i school, there's five schools of normative Islamic law. Depending on what school you follow, or if you don't follow a particular school, just know that there are some differences of opinion with regards to whether or not those six days should come right after Eid, like that is to say, like starting the second of Shawwal, you start the six days, or you can fast any six days during that month, or there's, an, there's also opinions that say that you can fast for the, re the remainder of the year, so any time between that Ramadan and the following Ramadan. So between that Ramadan and to, and to the next Ramadan, you can, you can fast those six days. But fasting the six days of Shawwal is considered a very laudable and praiseworthy sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And so again, there it is, right there, right? To continue the practice. And this is why, among the other prophetic teachings, was to not only fast the six days of Shawwal, but to also fast, for example, Mondays and Thursdays or fast the three days that come right in the middle of the lunar year, which are considered the bright or the white days, because that's where you have the full moon. And so the fasting the 13th, 14th, and 15th of a lunar, moon, a lunar cycle. Uh, to fast every other day, uh, which was the fast which was considered the fast of Dawood, or the fast of David, peace be upon him. To fast every other day. Uh, as long as you don't fast every consecutive day, which is against the normative practice of the Prophet, that is to say, is contra to the Sunnah, contra, contrary to the Sunnah, contra Sunnah, um, you can fast. And in fact, think of all of the various opportunities that you have in Ramadan, whether it's the fasting, whether it's the night vigil that we pray at the mosque and congregation or at home, whether it's the spiritual it to get the spiritual retreat that often is performed in the last 10 days, whether it's the recital of the Qur'an, whether it's being charitable, whether it's being generous, so on and so forth. All of the various blessings and opportunities that we have, uh, we can avail ourselves of in Ramadan, we can do so throughout the year. In fact, there are times throughout the year where those particular actions are considered to be highly praiseworthy, right? We know that there are certain times of the year that it is highly encouraged to fast. It's not obligated, like Ramadan is, but it's highly encouraged. It was a practice that the Prophet never gave up. He always fasted, for example, 
the 9th and 10th of Muharram, of the month of Muharram. He always fasted the day of Ashura, which is the day of Arafat, right? The, the, the 9th of Dhul Hijj, and so on. These were practices of the Prophet that he kept regardless of whether he was traveling, how old he was, throughout, you know, throughout his Prophet Nabuwa. So again, those are opportunities that we have to continue to avail of the very, uh, various and sundry blessings in the month of Ramadan, okay? So a few more, a few more uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, reflections, and then maybe we'll get into more specifics about Ramadan and then open the floor for questions and answers. Um, is that, I wanted, I wanted to say something not specific to Ramadan itself, but to worship in general. Because after all, Ramadan is worship. Fasting is worship. The word for worship in, in Arabic, of course, is ibadah, right? Ibadah. And one of the verses in the Quran uh, that speaks specifically to ibadah, or worship, is a verse found in the 51st chapter of the Quran, verse 56, sort of that yet, where Allah, God Almighty, He says in, in, in the Quran, uh, um, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ that I have created, oh, this is God speaking, I have created jinn kind and mankind for the sole purpose, or for no other purpose, except ibadah, except worship. Now worship, or this technical term ibadah, right, is a very inclusive, a very broad and inclusive uh, term. It includes moral acts or acts of morality, it also includes a ceremonial aspect to it. And what do I mean by that? And I'll talk about that. I'm not going to focus so much on the moral teachings, because I think, by and large, we, we, we know them, we share them, we talk about them, being truthful, being honest, being courteous, having good adab, good comportment, being a gentleman, being a lady, right? Uh, that th those kinds of things, uh, being honest in our dealings, in our transactions, and so on, being courteous and generous with our neighbors. These are various things, uh, dressing modestly, right? The hijab, or dressing in some form, in some uh, modest fashion for men and women. These are moral teachings, but they're also acts or ways in which, if you want to get fancy, modalities of ibadah. They're, they're ways in which we can engage in ibadah. But then there's the very critical and foremost ceremonial aspects of ibadah. And by that I mean the rituals that we perform, quote-unquote rituals that we perform, the ceremonial rituals. And by that I'm including fasting, I'm including prayer, I'm including zakat, right, which is the obligatory uh, charity that we give, the hajj, the pilgrimage to the, to the house of God, to the Kaaba, to in, in, in Mecca. These are the ritual. Uh, or the ceremonial forms or modalities of ibadah. Now when it comes to ibadah as a whole, but certainly when it comes to these specific ceremonial parts of ibadah, we have to ask ourselves the question, or we should know the answer to this question, which is, or these following questions. First is, why do we worship God? Why am I fasting? Why do I pray five times a day, or attempt to, or do my best? Why do I give charity? Why do I give zakat? Why do I perform the hajj? Why, why do we engage in ibadah, in worship? Are you asking? <clears throat> I, I am, sorry, it's not rhetorical. Or I can keep it rhetorical and keep it going, but I'd love to hear, yeah. Why do we, why do, why do we worship God in these ways? Because that's what God wants. Thank you. That's the, that's the perfect answer. So, and again, um, I tend to, now, you, you got to understand, so when I, when I lecture to, like, youth, like high school students, which, as I'm getting older and older, I find it more and more challenging. One, I mean, I have a teenage daughter, so that's challenging enough. But, but I mean, every time, so is that I tend to use kind of 50 cent words. Uh, they used to call me Uncle SAT, because, you know, you attend a lecture, you probably get some SAT words. Um, but I think it's important to speak in, 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 in language that other religious communities will also share with us. And that's why I do so. I don't do it to sound fancy or whatever. But what the brother just shared with us, 
about why we worship God is because God tells us or instructs us. You know, that is the ontological reason for Ibadah. There's that 50 cent word, right? There's ontology, which is what connects us to the divine, what connects us with God. And so the ontological reason why we do worship, why we worship, is because God told to, is because God commands it, command, commands it of us, demands it of us. In particular, for example, the fasting, he says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, O people of faith, kutiba alaykum usiyam. Fasting has been ordained for you, has been prescribed for you, has been commanded upon you. Period. End of story. So we worship God because God wants it of us, demands it of us. We could just stop right there. But out of the out of the bounties and the grace and the love and the compassion and the mercy that God has for us as his obad, as his servants, as, his, as those engaged in worship to him and of him, he gives us other reasons for why we also worship. Or he gives us other benefits that we can achieve and accrue in addition to simply following his commands that we get the added blessings of, or we get the added opportunity to avail certain blessings, and we have other, if you will, purposes for why we engage in ibadah. The first of those are so, first is the ontological reason for why we worship, right, which is God commands it of us. Second reason for why we worship is the eschatological reason, there's the other fancy word, but that means that we can accrue benefit in the life hereafter, in the akhirah, akhirah the life after death. And so we may or may not see those benefits in this life, but we, are, we should have a certitude and certainty in belief, in knowing that we will be rewarded for our good deeds in the life hereafter. We must have certitude and certainty of that. Not in a sort of arrogant sense, but we worship with the certitude of knowing that if we worship God and we follow His commandments, that God will reward us. That's actually a part of worship, is to, is to ex have expectation of it being accepted by God and then that we will be rewarded by God. And so those are rewards that we will see only in the life hereafter. Okay? And so this is why, for example, in the hadith, in one of the statements of the Prophet, one of the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said that for every good deed that the son, that Ibn Adam, the descendants of Adam do, they will get their reward, whether it's tenfold, whether it's seventyfold, or a hundredfold. And then there's fasting. And fasting, Allah says, fasting is for me. And what the commentary, what, what, what our scholars tell us is what that means is God has assigned fasting and the reward for that fast to himself, exclusive to himself. That's to say, he's not, he's not detailing specifically what those rewards will be. But we know that those rewards will be exponential. And those rewards will be in the akhirah, in the life hereafter. Okay? But in, in addition to those uh, uh, ontological reasons for why we worship God, and those eschatological reasons for why we worship God, there is also utilitarian value and benefit in this life. And what I mean by that is that you will achieve certain blessings and we worship God because we can attain certain things right here in this life. What I just laid out, this matrix, right, of rewards and why we do the things we do relates to all forms of ibadah, whether it's the moral ibadah that we talked about or the ceremonial ibadah. And with regards to specifically when we look at, because oftentimes the moral uh, forms, we, we, we understand, we see where the utility is. I dress modestly, people respect me, people engage with me in a certain way. I uh, feel comfortable in not displaying my ornaments and my nakedness and so on. Or if I don't lie, or if I don't cheat, you see, I mean, those things are easy to see and identify. But oftentimes what we fail to see sometimes is the utility and the utilitarian value 
of our ceremonial modalities of worship. Specifically, for example, in this context, we're going to talk about Ramadan. And so Ramadan gives us certain utilitarian value and benefit right here in this life, right? For example, and I think this sort of like to, 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 to talk about the lowest hanging fruit, pardon the expression, I know we're all hungry, but uh, in terms of the lowest hanging fruit there, um, medical science now is now telling us about the uh, many, many health benefits of interval fasting, of intermittent fasting, right? Medical science now, study after study, shows about the level of, uh, or, the, or the value that fasting has when it comes to lowering, lower, lowering triglycerides, cholesterol levels, um, in terms of uh, removing toxins from the body. So people talk about detox, right? Self-care, detox. Fasting is the ultimate way of detoxing, right? Fasting has various health benefits. Now again, remember, we don't worship or we don't fast because we're gonna lose weight or we're gonna have lower or you know, better blood work next month. We do it for the pleasure of Allah, but these are added, again, added values that we get because Allah is all merciful. And so the health benefits of fasting. Uh, fasting gives us a sense of time consciousness, right? We're aware of time. We see how important and critical time is. And not only that, we see that oftentimes because the days feel pretty long, right? Let's be honest. There's nothing wrong with being honest and keeping it real. Days feel long, especially when you're fasting. But we also realize, wow, that's a lot of time that outside of the month of Ramadan, either I've been unaware of and I'm not conscious of all the time, as I am minute by minute, hour by hour when we're fasting, that we can avail ourselves of that time. That time still presents the same 24 hours in a day, right? The same productive hours in a day. It's just that we are caught up in the dunya, in the world, the affairs. And we're not as cognizant of time as we are in the month of Ramadan because our bellies are empty and we're thirsty, right? And so, again, time consciousness, the value of time, is another utilitarian value and benefit that we can see and benefit from in this life. Um, right here, right now, kind of thing. Um, another added value and benefit of Ramadan is that it brings communities together. It brings our community together. And so, uh, you know, I think it's so praiseworthy and, and encouraging to see MCC uh, as a mosque right here in the Bay Area do a program like this. Uh, because, frankly, to be really honest with you, um, you know, had other mosques been doing activities like this, that is to say, creating a space for those who are new to the faith, or those that are newly reconnecting with the faith, frankly, right, to allow a space uh, where people who are new or disenfranchised from the community can feel welcomed, can feel that they can belong to this community. It's okay. Yeah, I'm new kid on the block. I'm, I'm Johnny come lately. But guess what? I have a place on the table. I have a place in the community. My community is going to welcome me. My community isn't going to judge me if I show up dressed a certain way or if I show up uh, with tattoos or whatever, right? that my community is going to afford me a space, is going to give me an opportunity to be, to live a life of dignity and fulfillment in the midst of that community. Frankly, if other mosques, if all of our Islamic centers were, were as open as MCC is, there wouldn't be need, there wouldn't be the need for an organization like Tali that focuses specifically on convert prayer and, and creating communities where people feel welcome. And so I think it's highly laudable and encouraging that a community like MCC allows a space like this. And again, it's something that I wish and I hope that other mosques learn from if they haven't been doing already. And I can tell you, just as someone who's been around the block a few times, uh, the vast majority of mosques aren't, unfortunately. And that goes not only for those who are new to the faith, newcomers to the faith, but also those who are reconnecting, as I said, to the faith. Or those who are, as I said, uh, have a, there's a tendency in our community to disenfranchise. And I mean specifically our sisters. Yeah. I mean specifically uh, uh, our youth. Mm -hmm. People who don't feel a sense of belonging. Feeling a sense of uh, 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 comfort. And the fact that the mosque is going to give me 
that space that I need to grow and to come into my own and to allow and afford me a non-judgment zone where I can come as, you know, to, uh, one of the sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, low uh, mottos of Talif that we've adopted that comes from Imam Sayyid actually, is come as you are to Islam as it is. Come as you are. Come as you are, un unquestioned, un, uh, uh, you know, open welcome. There's no, there's no, uh, uh, you know, uh, the word escapes me, but open welcome regardless, right? Um, so that's the kind of community space that we hope to create. But again, at least what Ramadan affords us is it allows our communities to come together. We come together to break fast, whether it's at the masjid or in someone's house, but it allows us an opportunity to come together. If nothing else, it allows our families to come together. We cook together, we prepare the fat, we break the fast together, we prepare the meals together. Uh, I know just in my own household, as busy as we are on a day-to-day -day basis, Ramadan, just by the virtue of what it is, uh, you know, we come together, we cook, we, we, we break bread together, regardless of how busy we are. Because again, that's something very special about Ramadan. And so, on Ramadan, again, one of the utilities and benefits that we see in this month is that it allows us that opportunity to connect with the community. Certainly the night vigil, the night tarawih prayers, every night, right, you see the masjid filled, row after row, with people who are coming and performing the tarawih prayer. You see people that you haven't seen in a while. You see people frequently, uh, enough to create a relationship, start a relationship if you don't know someone. And so again, those are all benefits and values that we can attain. And I can keep going on and on and on, right? And I don't want to take too much more of your time, but to talk about these, you know, of, of this utility and benefit that we see in this month of Ramadan. But the important thing with these lessons, going back to what I said at the very, very outset, right? Which is if we see Ramadan as that boot camp, if we see Ramadan as that sprint for the marathon that is life, then it is critical for us to continue with the blessings that we learn and that we attain in this, in this month of Ramadan beyond the month of Ramadan, right? We have to sustain this. And this is why the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said that the best actions in the eyes of God are those actions that are small, right? So they're not a performance, right? Again, we talked about Ramadan earlier, about we, how we see Ramadan as a sprint. We also see Ramadan as kind of a performance, right? You give it your all, it's this big opportunity to, to kind of showcase where we are. And I don't mean to others, I just mean, we just give it, that's the attitude that we have for ourselves. That this is that moment that I've been kind of training for all year, and I'm going to give it my all. But that performance, right? Um, I lost train of, my, my, my train of thought here, what I was saying. Um, but is that is that it's not just a performance piece, right? And and that and that and that the right that the best actions are those that may not be those performance level actions. They may be small, but we do them frequently, right? Those are the actions that are best or that are most. Uh, the, the hadith specifically says, of them or most rewarded or most beloved to God are those actions that are small, right? But that are done frequently. And so those are the lessons that we, uh, and, and that is certainly true, not just of outside of the month of Ramadan, but even of those things that we, those habits that we develop in the month of Ramadan. And, and finally, to sort of wrap up, you know, 29 to 30 days is the almost perfect amount of time that a person needs to pick up a good habit or to, or to drop off a bad habit. 29 to 30 days. I mean, you can talk to uh, behavioralists and uh, psychologists who will, who will tell you the same thing. Therapists. 29, 30 days. That, that's like almost the sweet spot, right? Where if you do something frequently or you do something for 29 or 30 days, it becomes a habit. And if you give off something and you deprive yourself for, of something for 29 or 30 days, more likely than not, you're not going to go back to that bad habit. And so again, this is a blessing from God, is that we have this month, this time period, where we can develop good habits, and we can refrain from the 
from the, from our from from those habits that are less than desirable, those that we've been trying to kick for a while, but haven't been successful in doing so, right? We can do so in the month of Ramadan. So some of us have a sweet tooth, and we can't give up those desserts, and you know our doctors are screaming at us because our, not only are our waistlines expanding, our blood work is terrible, triglycerides, high sugar, high diabetes, uh, heart disease. This is that month where you can kick the habit on junk food, on those sweets, right? Fried foods, fatty foods. It allows us that opportunity to train our bodies and train ourselves, right? And, and taking care of the mind and the body and the soul are equally important, brothers and sisters, right? These are God, you know, the, the human being is a composite of the mind, body, and soul. One of the beauties of Islam is that it has never viewed the human being as either a, a, a spiritual creature alone that is void of any physical or mental needs, or doesn't view the human being as an animal, as a beast, who only can, has its, his or her physical needs or appetites, but rather it views the human being in totality. And not only does it view the human being in totality, it recognizes that they are all inter interrelated. If we feel better about ourselves physically, then we have the energy, we have the ability, we have the capability to engage and stand in those long prayers. Right? If you're not physically able, you're not physically able. So phys one's physical state is related to one's mental state, is, is related to one's spiritual state. So we are a composite, we are a holistic human being of a mind, body, and soul. So it's important to talk about all these issues. Um, and then I'm going to close out with this and wrap, up, and wrap with this is that, I'm not going to wrap, but I'm going to wrap up with this, is, is, is that, um, believe me, you don't want to hear me wrap, um, is that one of the things that we learn in the month of Ramadan is that, is that the Prophet ﷺ tells us that in the month of Ramadan, the shayateen, Right? Those evil uh, spirits or demonic forces, demonic forces, are chained and locked up. Right? The shayateen are locked up, and that the doors of heaven are open, and the doors of jahannam or, or hellfire are closed. So it speaks to the many blessings that, as I said earlier, literally descend from the heavens with regards to us availing ourselves of those blessings, and at the same time. Uh, people are, more people are saved from the hellfire in the month of Ramadan. The Prophet said that more people of my ummah will be saved from the uh, hellfire on two occasions. One is on the day of Arafat, uh, which is the ninth of the, the Hijj, or when, when the pilgrims stand on the Mount of Arafat. And the other is the month of Ramadan, that more people are saved from damnation in the life hereafter. In the, at those two times of the year. And so Ramadan presents us that opportunity. So one of the explanations of the fact that the shayateen, those demonic forces, are locked up is that that, that, that that whisper that you hear to do something bad or to not get up in the morning for fajr or to not uh, fast or to not uh, do something good and engage in something that's prohibited or haram, that whispering that we hear, what the Quran calls waswasa, right? That whispering that we hear, that's what we're hearing is our own ego and our own nafs because the shayateen are locked up. So you can't blame the demons anymore. And you can't blame the demonic forces anymore. Uh, because demonic forces and demonic forces, uh, whisperings are real. I'm not, let's not downplay that. We can talk about that during the discussion portion, because oftentimes we get so assured uh, of our rational and being able to rationalize everything that, well, demonic forces, that seems a little medieval. No, demonic forces are real. Angelic forces are real. We believe in that. that we have a sense of yaqeen in that, belief in that. In fact, we have to believe in that in order to be considered Muslim. You have to believe in these miraculous things. So yes, angelic forces are real. Demonic forces are real. But having said that, in the month of Ramadan, we know that the shayateen are locked up. And so all we're left with is our ultimate enemy, and the, our mortal enemy. And that's the enemy that we are born with, and that we will die with. And that is our nafs, our ego, 
our lower or baser selves. And so what this month of Ramadan teaches us, right, is to cut off the supply that that, that, that ego needs. Because what that ego needs, think of, you know, honestly, like, I, this is how I should tell my kids, so I'm not, don't, don't, don't take this the wrong way. I mean, this isn't me speaking down to you. I just think that the analogy makes sense. The ego, the nest is like the cookie monster, right? Like just, you know, just, just, just wants to eat, wants to consume, wants to consume. And all it does is it feeds, right? That's what the ego wants. It wants to feed, whether it's food, whether it's, uh, you know, something to drink, or whether it's lust, right? Lusting after the opposite gender, sexual appetites. Those are things that... That's what the ego wants. That's what it thrives off of. And what Ramadan says, or what Ramadan allows us, is to, is to put that ego on fast. Put that ego on a diet. And we don't get to feed that ego all the time. And, and feed that insatiable appetite of that ego. And so we are slowly depriving our ego of the things it needs. Not with the hope that we're ever going to defeat it or kill the ego. Because the ego is a part of the human experience. Like it or not, it's here to stay. But what we can do is we can weaken the appetite. We can weaken the nafs, the ego. You can't eradicate it, but you can weaken it. So that outside of the month of Ramadan, its appetite is now shrunk. Its, 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 its desire to consume, be that cookie monster, is been tamed. You've tamed the beast a little. You're no longer a slave to the appetites, but rather you have enslaved your appetites. And so that's what Ramadan affords us. And what Ramadan also does is it teaches us a very, very important life lesson. Right? And this is something I imagine we all share with our children and we all share with those younger than us because just life experience teaches you this thing. This, or this experience, this very important life lesson. And that is that no matter how much you want something, and how much you desire something, guess what? You may not get it. That's just the reality of life. You may not always get what you want. And that's what Ramadan teaches us every day, every minute, right? I want that. I want food right now. I wanted food two hours ago. Just real, real talk, right? I wanted to break my fast with some cold water because I was through. I went on a bike ride with my daughter who isn't fasting, and I was just, I was, I was parched, right? I would love to have a high, you know, nice tall cold drink of water. Sorry, it's like the low hanging fruit. We're, 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 we're really close though, so inshallah, twenty more minutes, twenty five more minutes. Um, you want that, but guess what? Life isn't always fair. You're not always going to get what you want. And if you get what you want, even if I get, even if you get what you want, you might not get what you want how you wanted it. I may want to break my fast, but guess what? They only cook biryani. And guess what? I don't like biryani. I'm real, I'm real tough again. My brother, my ears not going to believe this because he's like, what? Your parents are from the subcontinent? You don't love biryani? Yeah, real talk. I don't like biryani. <laughs> so MCC did me a disservice by offering me only biryani for iftar. I'm not saying that's what they did, but let's just say that's what they did. So I gotta break my fast now, but guess what? I might get what I want, which is I get the opportunity to break one. I mean, I may, I may, I may get what I want, but it's not how I want it. It's not what I wanted specifically. But that's life. That's life. And so Ramadan teaches us that very. And we may think this is kind of esoteric or whatever. But it's a very real life lesson that we learn in the month of Ramadan. And I know I keep saying this last point, last point, or by way of conclusion, um, but I promise this is the last point. And that is that the, the, another thing that we learn in this month is that, or another, one of the other things that we uh, can reflect on in this month is that the, the day of, or fasting, Right? The experiences that we have while we're fasting, and then the breaking of the fast, day in and day out, in those 29, 30 days. That's God teaching us and telling us and giving us a little glimpse uh, of what life really is like. 
is that life is a life, or life is, or I should say this life, you know, the, the life of this world, is a life of struggle. It's a life that you're going to be challenged. Uh, and that's what fasting is. It challenges us, right? We're, we're, we're hungry. We're thirsty. We have voluntarily deprived ourselves of food and drink and sexual relationships with our mates uh, for this purpose or in this month of Ramadan. We voluntarily did that. And that's analogous to life. That's an analogous to analogy to life. Because life is rough. Life is difficult. Life is challenging. And we may not always get uh, uh, you know, all the things that we want in life. And life may not always give us what we want, but that's just the reality of Hayat dunya of the life of this world. And that the only time that we will be rewarded truly and wholly and be truly satiated and fulfilled is in the life hereafter. And that the, that the Akhirah, the life hereafter, is predicated upon the belief that this life is going to be limited. This life is going to have its challenges. It's not always going to be fair. It's not always going to be equitable and just. But that the life hereafter is, the, is that moment where we break our fast, where we get rewarded, where we get what we want, where we get what we seek, inshallah ta'ala, hopefully, God, God willing, and that's what we endeavor for in this life. Is that, yeah, I'm going to fast through the day so I can get that moment of the, of the, fa of the breaking of the fast. And that's what life is all about. Is yes, we struggle and we toil and we, and, we, and we have challenges in life. And we may not always get answers to those challenges. Those challenges may not always leave us. But guess what? We will be rewarded. And we will be satisfied and we will attain happiness and satiation in the life hereafter. So the fasting that you're doing right now is analogous to life itself, brothers and sisters. This is what life's all about. Life's a struggle, and you hope for the reward afterwards. You hope that they're not serving you just biryani for it. <laughs> all right? Jazakumullah khair, thank you. Um, I'm going to open up the, um, the, the uh, floor for questions, comments. Just so you know, uh, uh, it's going to be again if we're not be on it. So. <laughs> yeah. um, so before we open it up, I do want to mention just two housekeeping things. Next week, we have at the same time, we have a new uh, interfaith of here, which means that we're having people from all the churches, synagogues around the um, Tri-Valley mostly coming down here, which means that for you, this is an opportunity maybe to invite any friends, family members who might uh, want to learn about your faith, learn about uh, the fast, which is going to be the topic. It's going to be about faith. The, the topic itself will be about why faith is still uh, matters, why faith still matters, but it's also going to touch on Ramadan and fasting. So uh, that's your opportunity. And then the following Sunday, we have a special needs iftar, which means that if there's any families that have children or anybody with disabilities in their family, we want to make the and if are just especially for them. Um, so you can see more details on the bulletin board and well, I think Sister Aisha or I will send an email out about that as well. So, Q&A now. So, who's the first break soul? <laughs> Maybe we just have people talk about themselves. I'd really like to learn about sure. a group here. So maybe I can just have the mic go around and that's okay, putting you on the spot, just to say a little bit about yourself. I think we're T minus, what, 20 minutes away from Iftar? Yeah. So, yeah. Is it 21 to 22? I think 24. 24, yeah. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with this sister right here. Oh, I'm not you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. That's mine then. Okay. <laughs> this is my wife. Um, um, she, she was born into the faith. Um, she likes biryani. You know, she's from some kind. <laughs> But all parents are. Um, yeah, my name is Steve. Um, I'm also an attorney. I'm an attorney here. Um, we just moved here about two months ago. Um, yeah, I'm not a new convert. I converted a long time ago, like 20 years ago in Philadelphia. 
during law school. Um, but yeah, we just figured this would be a good event just to um, just to come to meet some other members of the community since we're new here, um, and especially new people from a somewhat similar background. Uh -oh, how long have you been there? Uh, about five, five years. years. Yeah. Next Friday. Yeah. Next Friday. Yeah. Well, I'm seeing another wife remember. <laughs> 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 remember. That's great. And they've got a three year old daughter, uh, Nyla. Uh, Nyla? Yeah. yeah. That's, my, that's my second daughter. Oh, okay. The one who wasn't fast in the one. Oh. oh, okay. You want to drag me on that bike ride tonight? <laughs> <laughs> that's Nyla. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Mike, so uh, I converted about three years ago at uh, MCA, um, so actually coming up uh, in the cold days, three years, uh, May 29th, so I still remember. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so I still remember that, so that was uh, a lot of people kind of uh, asked me the question, you know, uh, are you sure you want to do it, because it was right before, a couple days before round round. Like, you can wait, you can wait for your day. As I said, you know, it's the time is right, so you know, so, so I did it. So, um, so yeah, but uh, I actually did have a question. Yes, um, so, obviously, being uh, being new to everything and kind of staying up uh, on the parish and everything like that, there, there's always that, that little voice in the back of my head that's saying, hey, are you doing it right? Are you, you know, um, is he, uh, he going to judge you for that um, and, and stuff like that? So. Um, for me, I guess, uh, maybe for some other people, is what type of resources can we look into? Um, obviously, it's kind of hard to, uh, at times, to ask for help, but, um, you know, what type of things do you recommend for us to maybe perform, um, to be better at our prayers, to be better at our EMAC? Mm. Um, um, better about praying regularly or on time? Is that yeah, and just knowing if you're doing it correctly, uh -huh. and, you know, and, right. and, and how, how has that looked upon? Mm. Yes. So, I mean, I think the, the, the short answer to your question, and, and one that is short on the surface, but I think it, it speaks to something much larger and deeper, and that is, you know, is to equip yourself with knowledge, right? Knowledge is um, the ultimate uh, weapon, not only in terms of that voice that, 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 that you were talking about, which is, um, you know, that, that the struggle to pray on time. If you're better equipped with knowledge, of not only of the uh, importance and reasons for why we pray and, and, and why and the importance of the prayer and the centrality of the prayer uh, in, in, our, in our lives and in our faith, um, all of that can be gained only through knowledge, right? You only come to know about the, about the importance and the centrality of the prayer through knowledge. It's not necessarily, although it can happen, it's not necessarily something that just comes by way of experience alone. It's by knowing and just knowing the importance and the centrality, as I said, of the prayer. Um, in, in, in terms of, uh, I think, you know, other resources beyond equipping ourselves with knowledge, and again, when, when we, or before we leave the topic of knowledge itself, it's important to note that, I mean, when we talk about knowledge or the pursuit of knowledge, you know, it's a lifelong endeavor, right? It's something that you are going to be embarked, you are embarking on a journey that is never going to reach its conclusion. You are embarking on a journey that's never going to end. Uh, it is going to continue to have to be revisited, continue to have to be developed and built upon, uh, no matter how long you've been into the faith, no matter if you were born into the religion or not, doesn't matter. And that pursuit of knowledge and of gaining knowledge and accruing, of, of acquiring knowledge is something you're, that is going to last with you uh, until you die. That's, it's a lifelong struggle and journey. And so, you know, continuing to, not, to, to grow in one's uh, knowledge and awareness uh, about the religion and about the, the aspects of the, of the faith, whether it's prayer or fasting or anything else for that matter, um, you know, there are those uh, areas of knowledge that are what, are, what, what the scholars consider to be uh, or individually obligatory upon us. So that is to say that we are individually responsible for a certain amount of knowledge. And typically, when we talk about fardain knowledge, we're talking about that knowledge which deals with, again, the ibadat, right? The, 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 the worship. So, how do we pray? Do we, how are we praying correctly? What are the timings for the prayer? What are the prerequisites of the prayer? What are the re required components to the prayer? And so on and so forth. In order for that prayer, prayer to be accepted or acceptable. 
Same thing with the fast, same thing with charity, the zakat, calculating it, same thing with the hajj. Those are required, uh, those are examples of required knowledge, what we consider to be fardayin, as I said. And that's not an exhaustive list, that's just some examples. We also have to know God, we have to know about God, the essence of God, who God is, um, and, and, and how we conceptualize God, and how we invoke God. All of those things come, again, by way of knowledge. Now, how do we gain knowledge? We gain knowledge by finding resources within our community where we can individually study, because there's still a great amount of blessing in being able to individually find, or perhaps a group of us find, a scholar or a teacher that we can learn from. So, you know, oftentimes we think that that's difficult or challenging, or I don't know people in the community, there are resources, and I think, frankly, the Bay, the, the Bay Area in particular, we are singularly blessed. Uh, I've lived in a lot of different places, and I've been here for eight, nine years. We are blessed with the amount of scholars that we have in our midst, in our communities, that we can tap into, resources that we can tap into to gain that knowledge that we need. Um, the other thing about prayer that I want to also mention that isn't specific to knowledge or, 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 or related to that is that... And this may not be just true for, for prayer. Maybe you can extrapolate for other, uh, whether it's fasting or what, what have you. Is that oftentimes people approach prayer or any particular, what I call the modality of worship earlier, these various forms of ibadah earlier, as being the end-all, be-all. That is to say that the prayer, if I just, if, that this prayer is... I'm going to have this life-changing event that's going to take place if I pray properly or if I pray on time, that I'm going to instantly see some dividends and some gain, instantly. And that's just not how prayer works. That's just not how fasting works, right? You're never, not every prayer is going to allow you to achieve that aha moment, that moment of epiphany, of, of, of epiphany or spiritual greatness. But rather, it's the process. It's the continuing to pray day after day, year after year. And through continuing to do those forms of prayer, or fasting, or giving to charity, what all, it goes for all the various categories we talked about, that that's when you'll begin to see change. Right? It's not that change is going to come instantly, or it's going to come, or it's going to come rapidly comes after a process, or it comes through, I should say, it comes through the process of doing something regularly, continuously, for the rest of your life. So that's something important that we also have to, have to, have to keep in mind when we, when, we, when we try to reflect on and engage in a kind of, 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 of uh, in introspection, where we say, well, you know, something's lacking in my prayer, but we're oftentimes too hard on ourselves because is that because our expectations are too high, or our expectations are misplaced, that we think that any one prayer, or if I, hey, I've been praying now for a year, and still I'm in the same place I was a year ago. But guess what, you just have to keep at it. And that's the virtue and the blessing of the prayer, right? The point of the journey is the journey itself. It's not the destination. There is no destination. The rewards will be with God, but it's the journey, it's the continuing to do something. So hopefully that sheds some light on, 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 on your question. Um, which way are we going? Yes, sir. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sean. Sean. Uh, I converted two years ago at Toledo, actually. Um, just decided to come out here and share this beautiful month of Ramadan with this community and meet some fellow newcomers to this faith. Wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. Brother, right there. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Brandon. Next. Yes, sir, Brandon. Uh, and I, 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 uh, I found Islam on uh, November 12th of last year, uh, right here. And um, I think I, my fiance definitely is an excellent, excellent teacher and really kind of guided me to this. And I was, I just, I'm just so happy to be a part of it because I was never, uh, I, I never had a religion before. 
So, uh, so I'm still learning, and I'm just kind of humbled by all the information and just uh, the stories of the Prophet Muhammad um, and peace be upon him. I really enjoy the stories and really just kind of falling in love with uh, with everything. So happy to be here. May your love affair continue to grow. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Heather Assalamu alaikum. And um, I started to look at Islam immediately after 9 11. And it's taken me many, many years to get where I am because I was raised a Christian. And uh, I'm very happy to find a community here. I moved here in December. And I'm really happy to find a lot of nice Muslims to talk with and to get support from. And I'm glad I'm here. Welcome. Uh, you know, and just a quick reflection or a point of reflection is that, you know, um, if, you, if you listen to stories uh, about our elders, uh, especially those, and I mean specifically elders, who came into Islam, um, let's say in the 60s or 70s, uh, or maybe even into the 80s, um, but you know, uh, more often than not, you'll hear, you know, the autobiography of Malcolm X be mentioned as kind of a, a turning point or a moment where they read the autobiography of Malcolm X and they were influenced and they were forever changed, and that that began that planted the seed of of, of Islam in their lives. Um, you, you often hear that, and and uh, at least in, in the many people that I've been able to engage with of that generation. What I think we're finding, um, what I'm finding more, you know, among um, people who converted um, more recently, and certainly that speaks to a certain age of people as well, but, um, you know, is that 9-11, 9-11, this, this catastrophic day and, and event in American history um, would really serve as that, uh, as that um, event where people began to be curious about Islam, to learn and to study Islam, um, because your story, um, and, and again, your experiences are unique to you, but you share in that with a lot of other people, who I, who, at least in my experience that I've come across, who, you know, 9-11, or the events of 9-11, and all that talk about Islam in the days and weeks and months that followed, um, you know, really kind of served as an impetus for them to study the faith, and, you know, their hearts were open to it. So, um, I think we're seeing kind of a turning point there as well. Yes, ma'am. So I'll link everyone. My name is Raquel, and I converted um, in San Diego about 13 years ago. I actually used to live in Pleasanton before I was Muslim, so it's really, really beautiful to see such a community here in Pleasanton, in p -Town. Um, so uh, I just wanted to touch on what the brother was asking about prayer. And I converted, I made my own like little prayer cards. And then I just saw at Tablif where we had a meeting that there are some actual prayer cards that you put on the ground. And I thought that's really practical, so maybe as part of this. Thank you. Thank you. I, and, um, the I'm, I'm impractical to a fault where I, I forget those little practical things, so thank you. I have an idea why card. prayer cards, but these are pretty cool. They're yeah. laminated. They're so cool. Um, and also, part of this is right about knowledge. You're always going to, you never stop learning from the cradle to the grave. And um, you can take classes here in the Bay, and there's also Seekers Hub online. Yeah. I've taken a class there. Wonderful it's reason. really, really, mashallah. So, and about the prayer, like he's right too, you know, we're, we're really hard on ourselves. But the most important thing is to have really good intention. Listen right now, like focus on the heart of the prayer, about ask, this is the time where your Lord asks you, where you can ask your Lord of anything that you want. And then make the intention to correct your prayer to, for the sake of Allah, and it'll come, inshallah. And, uh, you know, uh, Raquel mentioned specifically Seekers Hub, and I think it's important just to point out that, you know, and I, and I wholeheartedly endorse and agree that Seekers Hub is a wonderful resource. But, but since we're talking about online resources, I think that it's also important to mention that, you know, it's one of those things what they call the paradox of, cho of choice, right, where you have a lot of op options out there. You have a lot of resources and, and where you can get knowledge from. But I think equally important as, uh, as the fact that we begin, we've seen that growth 
in terms of materials available, we also have to be uh, informed consumers uh, out there. And so much like if you are making an automobile purchase, you want to be an informed purchaser. You want to be an in informed consumer. I think it's important that uh, to know that yes, while there are a there is a plethora of information and resources out there, some of that information and some of the some of those resources are a little spotty. Okay, let's just put it that way. And I'm not going to name names, but you know there are resources available online, readily available, as readily available as Seekers Hub, for example, that are not as reliable, let's just say, right? And you have to be careful in terms of where you get your, uh, our knowledge, because much like misinformation in any other field can be disastrous, when it comes to misinformation as far as our deen or our matters of our faith are concerned, it's, it's catastrophic, right? It is, this is life we're talking about. This is our, our after that we're talking about, our, our life hereafter. And so, and, and this is why, you know, many of the Salaf, uh, the earliest uh, uh, predecessors in the earliest uh, community would say that, you know, we should be very, very cautious of where we get knowledge. And this is why throughout Muslim, throughout the majority of Muslim history, over a thousand years, there was a very clear and delineated methodology that one followed in terms of how one became a scholar or studied with scholars. And so that was the case for over a thousand years. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, after colonialism and some of those experiences in the last two or three hundred years in the Muslim world, a lot of those institutions have been fractured. And a lot of those in in institutions have, uh, have really waned. And so we have to be careful at, at the same time of where we're getting our knowledge from. Um, and I don't have any you know, sort of magic guideline or roadmap that you can follow in terms of what's good out there, um, I can certainly point you to some really great resources. Um, but if, when in doubt, talk to someone who you consider to be trustworthy and knowledgeable in your own community about where to go for the right knowledge. Um, because that's equally as critical and as important as, as acquiring knowledge is, is, is the kind of knowledge that we're getting and, and the sources of that knowledge. Okay? Sorry, I want to make, make me sure I don't... So the mic is here, but I'm not sure how much longer you want to go before. That's right. Yeah, three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. We'll keep it voluntary. Whoever wants to really say, but please, but not you. You have to because you're only one. You don't <laughs> Um, as alaykum. Alaykum. My name is Michelle, and I converted in October um, when I decided that I was going to marry my husband, who's been, um, who's like born into, it's horrible, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, um, I mean, well, yeah, so yeah, I converted in October, and I married my husband. It's alright. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Welcome. Well, we're, well, I'm, I'm pregnant, so like I'm not fasting, but I'm learning about the religion still, and I learned a lot. Wonderful. And his family, and yeah, I think we're a minute away from the start, so we have a few Muslims event going on here. He's still there, don't worry. You said your name is Michelle. Yeah. Welcome, Michelle. Welcome, Michelle. Hopefully. And uh, wish you the best with the pregnancy, inshallah. Uh, may Allah give you a righteous offspring. Uh, and may Allah facilitate and make it easy for you, the pregnancy. Uh, um, and so, may Allah make it easy for you. And inshallah, uh, welcome to the faith and, and uh, welcome to the community. And we're here for you. So, thank you. Thank you. So let's, I guess, make our way. Thank you so much. Jazakumullah khair. May Allah bless you, reward you, uh, and make Ramadan, this Ramadan, very special. And may Allah accept all of our fasts and our ibadah in this month. Amen.